We left off last time by looking at the heat equation, ut is equal to kappa uxx. We have Dirichlet conditions on the boundaries. So here the boundaries are x equal to 0 and x equal to pi. And in this case, they're homogeneous boundary conditions, right? Because you remember homogeneous means they're 0. And we have an initial condition to satisfy, which says that at time t is equal to 0, the solution is equal to 1. Okay? So we managed to do the separation of variables procedure. We did it before several weeks ago, but we did it through all the different cases. We looked at the case where the separation constant is positive, it's negative, and it's equal to zero. Okay, and then we wrote down the solution that satisfies the boundary conditions, but not the initial condition. And so the solution that we found was um, that we found that u of x t, we added them all together, is the sum of 1 to infinity of bn times sine of n times x times an exponential of e minus n squared kappa times t. Okay? And if you don't remember, the, in this case, this lambda n parameter we had was equal to n and it indexed all the positive integers from 1 to infinity, okay? And the reason why we add them together in this fashion is firstly because it's linear. This allows us to construct a general solution. And then secondly, it's because basically each individual term of this series doesn't, doesn't satisfy the, um, this initial condition, okay? So now we need to set t is equal to zero in order to satisfy that initial condition. We have to find the bms so that we can satisfy this condition. So you set t is equal to zero into the problem, and then it tells you that essentially we need to find, so this says f of x is equal to one. We need to make sure that the, the coefficients bn are selected such that, I'll erase this here, Um, the, the separation coefficients are chosen such that the, so the coefficients bn are chosen such that this is true because t is equal to 0 and then that exponential becomes 1. Okay. Now, this is a Fourier series. In fact, it's a Fourier sine series. And there was a trick to doing this problem, which I tried to explain, and then I realized after I did the lecture, I maybe didn't explain it as well as I could have. Okay. And, and so I'll go over the explanation again, and I'll, I'll do it over here. So the initial condition that you need to satisfy, it's equal to 1 over the rightmost domain here. So this goes from 0 to pi. Okay. So you need a Fourier series, which looks like that, and is equal to 1 on the right-hand side from 0 to pi. Okay. And the trick is for you to actually think, oh, well, firstly, I know this is a sine series, and I know that there's a trick for resolving the sine series over a function that looks like this. The trick is that instead, you form the odd extension of the function. So you remember that given a zero to pi um, function, I can form the odd extension by just creating this at minus one. Okay, so now let me call this f o of x. So rather, f o of x is minus 1 from minus pi to 0, and then it's 1 from 0 to pi. Okay? Having done so, then I know that if I were to compute the Fourier series of f o of x, right, then I know that the Fourier series of f o of x is exactly that thing there, because it's just the sine series, there's no cosine coefficients in there. And I know that the bn's will be essentially 1 over pi, 1 over l, then the integral from minus pi to pi of f o of x sine of nx dx, like so. 
okay? Where this f o of x is, remember, that's minus 1 and then 1, right? But now, I know that this is an odd function, f o of x is an odd function, times sine, which is another odd function, the 2 is an even function, and so I can double up the interval, I can double up the integrand here, and then just integrate from 0 to pi of 1. Okay? The first time you see this kind of procedure, you might be a bit confused of this trick of making it into an odd function, right? And that's because usually, usually, um, you don't think of it that way. Usually I say, I first tell you, okay, I'm going to give you a function from 0 to pi, form the odd extension, and then find the Fourier series, at which point you jump right in on this line here and you go and do the calculation. Here, you had to kind of jump to that conclusion that I actually want to form the odd extension. Okay? So, now you just have to calculate this thing here. And so this is uh, integrate the sine function. It becomes minus 2 over n times pi of cosine of n times x evaluated from 0 to pi. Okay? And then... This is cosine of n times pi, which you remember to be minus 1 to the n, minus 1. Okay, so this is minus 2 times n pi, minus 1 to the n, minus 1, like so. All right? Okay, so this should, at this stage, because we've had two weeks of Fourier series, or hopefully, this will be pretty standard for you, how to calculate the Fourier series. And up to this step here, then, you can do it, right? So really learning how to solve the heat equation is just making use of all the, all the techniques we've already learned for Fourier series. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just make the final conclusion, and then we'll plot this on the computer and see how it actually looks, okay? So the final conclusion... So therefore, u of x t is equal to the sum from 1 to infinity of, and then in brackets, it was a minus 2 over n times pi, and then in brackets again, minus 1 to the n, minus 1, times the sine of nx multiplied by the exponential of minus n squared times kappa times t. Okay? And so, in total, this satisfies the heat equation because you made sure that each individual term of this series satisfies the heat equation. It satisfies the boundary condition, and you can just check that if I put x equal to 0 into here, it satisfies the boundary condition. If I set x equal to pi in this, I get zero, and it also satisfies the initial condition. In other words, this is a function which is one, well, it approaches one as you go to infinity, over the relevant interval from zero to pi. Okay, that's the basic idea. All right, let's have a look um, at what this looks like. Okay. Okay, so um, this is a MATLAB code, which is going to plot that series solution for us. I'm going to walk you through uh, bits of the code, okay? So firstly, um, we're going to use 20 terms of the series. This, this first two lines just clears everything and closes all the functions. We're going to plot 20 um, terms of the series, and then this is just a little function here that is going to construct each individual term which we computed before. So you can see it's minus 2 over n times pi minus 1 to the n minus 1 times that exponential times that sinusoidal. Then we construct a little vector here which goes from 0 to pi with a thousand points and we'll also need different from before. So before we were constructing Fourier series 
this time we need um, a time. So we're going to uh, plot different values of time from 0 to 5. Um, and we use 200 points from 0 to 5. Okay, and then what this little loop here does from j is equal to 1 to the length of the time. For each value of that time, it's going to construct the series and hence start off with u is equal to 0. And then for the n is equal to 20 modes of that series, so 20 terms of that series, it's just going to add up this r component, which is the general term that you saw before. Okay, so let's plot it now. Here we are. Okay, so you can see that at t is equal to zero, it looks approximately, I mean, so the, the blue here is the, the value that you want. At t is equal to zero, you want the solution to be one. So it's a bar of length pi from zero to pi with the boundaries of the bar being held at zero temperature you see zero here on the left and then zero on the right. But at initial time, at t is equal to zero, it's equal to one, okay? So the red is essentially the Fourier series solution. And if I were to include more than 20 terms, it would look even better than this, okay? And then now let's plot what happens as time increases. Well, actually before we plot what happens as time increases, let's try to figure out what we think is going to happen. So essentially, this is a bar that you've heated to a temperature of 1 initially, and then you let it go. And the ends of the bar are held at 0 temperature, at 0 degrees, if you like. Well, what's going to happen, you think, is that eventually the entire bar will be at 0 degrees. That, that's what makes sense. So you're expecting that this red line is eventually going to decay to 0. Okay, so let's run the simulation now. And that's what you see is happening. So as soon as time starts, the heat within the bar is decaying. The, the left end being held at zero degrees, the right end being held at zero degrees, and then eventually the entire bar approaching zero degrees. Okay, so that's nothing more than the Fourier series solution that we derived before. Okay, so um, let me just recap what just happened. As I said, you have a bar which goes from 0 to pi. The left end held at 0 degrees for all time. The right end held at 0 degrees at, for all time. And initially, at time t is equal to 0, it starts off at 1 here, okay? What's going to happen is that basically the solution is at small time, it's going to look like this. So the core of the, this is the temperature, this is U here, the core of the bar has not felt the, sort of the, the effect of the boundaries, which is being held at 0 degrees. Eventually, as time increases, the temperature increases in this direction, and then the entire heat, the, the entire temperature of the bar will eventually decay to zero. Okay. Someone has asked, does it eventually reach zero degrees? Well, it reaches zero degrees. You can see that this is basically what controls the, the, the overall heat of the bar, right? So as t goes to infinity, this exponential term decays to zero, right? And then the entire bar will decay to zero. So it's never going to reach zero degrees in finite time. It takes infinite time to reach zero degrees. Okay. Right. So let's go on. Okay. So now we've covered. So this is the basic idea of how you solve the heat equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions, which are homogeneous. The next part of the chapter, uh, chapter fifteen, is to study problems where it's in homogeneous boundary conditions, if this is not equal to zero, okay? And so you might ask, well, I, I don't understand why, why is that so tricky? Why do I need a separate section to do that? Why can't I just use all the methods that I did before? And that's an interesting question.
So, I just want to make a little note here. So, it's an interesting question of why you couldn't have just used the same techniques as you did before if this is not equal to zero, if say it was equal to one. Okay? And the basic idea is when you did the separation of variables procedure, you said, well, u of x t, you remember, was equal to a function of x times a function of t. And then you impose this boundary condition into this function to figure out what the boundary conditions were on x. So, for example, you impose that u of 0 and t was equal to 0. So that's x, big X of 0, times big T at t is equal to 0. And from this, you can claim that then big X of 0 is equal to 0. Because otherwise, big T of t is equal to 0, then you just have a trivial solution. Right? So that becomes the relevant boundary condition, and then away you go. Now, the problem is that if this is equal to 1 instead, then that rationale fails, right? So you can't make the claim that x of 0 is equal to 1. So this kind of method doesn't work anymore, but then it's a simple modification to make it work, right? So that's what the next bit is going to be about. Before I cover that next bit, I just want to write down, there's an algorithm which is presented um, in the notes, and I just want to review that algorithm for you of how to solve these zero Dirichlet type problems, the homogeneous type problems. Um, I don't think that you should really be memorizing these algorithms, um, but I hope that with practice they just become second major. So the algorithm is as follows. So in step zero, uh, what you do is you reduce the boundary value problem Uh, to homogeneous, I'm going to write homo G here, boundary conditions, homogeneous boundary conditions. Okay, And obviously at this point you don't really know, or you might not have read ahead, so you don't really know, well, how do I do that? Right? If I gave you an inhomogeneous boundary condition, how do you um, do that step one? Let's just assume that you're given homogeneous boundary conditions. You, you're going to set U of X and t to be a function of x times a function of t. Here I've used big T. Sometimes in the notes it uses a big G. Okay? And then you're going to solve um, with the boundary conditions for u n of x. Uh, let's write un here is xn of t, little x times tn of t. Okay, so this is just a notation. Remember, you put this in, you get sines or cosines, and you get a lambda, and that lambda turns out to be indexed by different n's. So you put that in, and then you get these modes. Okay, so sometimes, um, sometimes we call these modes. We, we call an individual separable solution a mode, or sometimes it's also called an, an eigenfunction very similar to an eigenvalue, right? So the lambda n's you want to solve for, and each one of these modes or each one of these eigenfunctions are then indexed by this lambda n, which is sometimes called an eigenvalue, okay? Then the third step is that, you know, you're going to use superposition, And you just add together all of these over the appropriate range of n's. And so now you, you have a series xn times cn here from wherever to wherever, usually from 0 to infinity, sometimes from 1 to infinity. Usually you get away with, you don't need the negative integers. Okay? And then finally, you're going to apply the, um, you're going to form the Fourier series. apply the initial condition, and solve for unknowns. In other words, each one of these modes, the xn times cn, usually has an unknown coefficient in front. I've not written the unknown coefficient here. It's like an an or a bn, and then you just apply the initial condition, and then you solve for the unknown. So that's the basic procedure that we just followed. 
I should say that I've um, rearranged the room and it makes it a lot harder for me to um, read the chat as we go. So I apologize this time around if you've asked questions I have not gotten to it. Okay, so we've now covered this algorithm for, this is for, if you like, zero Dirichlet problems. So zero or homogeneous problems. And the procedure for Neumann problems, so you remember this is a Dirichlet condition where you specify the value of the function. A Neumann problem is where you specify the derivative of the function, okay? And it's the same procedure and there are homework problems for you to try um, where it's a Neumann problem, but it's exactly the same procedure. The only difference is this step number two where you apply the boundary conditions. In this case, you apply it if big X being equal to zero for the two boundary conditions. If it's a Neumann condition, then it's usually the derivative of X is equal to zero, okay? So now let's talk about how you do it for the inhomogeneous version. Okay, and it's not hard, the inhomogeneous version, there's just a step that you have to do before you get to the separation of variables procedure. Okay, so the inhomogeneous version is the version where this is not equal to zero. Okay, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, erase this bit here and write down some generic inhomogeneous boundary conditions. So instead of u of x zero and t equal to zero, I'd like to change this to u of zero and t being a big t naught like that. I'm going to set the left-hand temperature to be something non-zero, and then u of uh, l and t to be equal to a big t1, like so. Okay, if you can't see this, um, it just says u of 0 and t is equal to t0, and u of l and t equal to t1. That's our generic inhomogeneous version of the problem. Okay? The basic idea is you want to first solve for what's called the steady state solution. Okay? So you imagine a bar, um, imagine a bar from 0 to L as in this picture, and I'm holding the temperature on the left here at a temperature T0, and I'm holding the temperature of the right at a temperature T1. Okay? Now, previously, the left-hand side was held at 0 degrees, right? and the right-hand side at 0 degrees. So after a long time, you would expect that if there's no other forcing in the system, there's no other heating that's occurring, eventually the bar, the entire bar, will be at 0 degrees. Okay? Now suppose that I hold one side of the bar at, say, 1 degree, and I hold the other side of the bar at 2 degrees. After a long time, the bar will evolve to a certain distribution of heat. And the question is, what is that distribution of heat? Okay, that's what's called the steady state solution. Okay, so we need to solve, so the trick to doing the inhomogeneous version is to solve for the steady state. And the steady state is nothing more than the temperature which is not time dependent, right? So, i.e., you want to solve, instead of u of x and t, let's write that as capital U of x. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to forget about the time dependence here. I'm just going to look for a solution which is only dependent on x. Okay? So now you substitute this into the PDE here, okay, and let's substitute in the boundary conditions. Now, obviously, you won't be able to satisfy the initial condition because the initial condition depends on time, right? But we want to find a solution that is independent of time. This is the solution that eventually the bar of heat evolves to, which satisfies the boundary conditions, okay? So therefore, du dt is equal to zero for this steady state because it doesn't depend on t, right? And if I substitute that into this system of equations, I'm left with zero equal to um, uxx, capital uxx, 
I can just drop the kappa because kappa is non-zero. And then I have to satisfy those two boundary conditions, which is then equivalent to capital U at zero being T naught and capital U at pi being equal to T1. Okay, so this is the solution, this is the heat distribution that the system will evolve to after a long time. Okay, so this is just integrate it twice in x and then apply those boundary conditions, and so it's a linear function. So big U of x is equal to ax plus b, and then you impose the two boundary conditions and it becomes um, t1 minus t0 over L times x plus t0. Okay, so just to make sure, if I set x equal to 0, I have t0. If I set x equal to L, I have t1 minus t0 plus t0, and hence I have t1. So that works. Okay, so it tells you that if you have a bar of heat from 0 to L, with the left hand side held at, zero, at temperature T0 and the right hand side held at temperature T1, then whatever the initial condition of the bar, it doesn't matter what the initial condition is, eventually the system will tend to a configuration in which the temperature is just a straight line that connects the two temperatures. That's the basic idea. Okay, um, someone has asked why why get the steady state solution? You'll see in a minute why you get it out. Right? Basically, the steady state will allow us to shift the boundary conditions so that this becomes zero. We'll, we'll get to that in a couple seconds, in fact. Okay? But even then, the steady state solution is an interesting um, quantity. Right? It's an interesting question of, to ask yourself, what is the eventual state of the bar? What is the temperature eventually in the bar? Okay? The other thing that I warned you of, which a lot of people do when they read the notes, is that they memorize this formula for the steady state solution. Don't do that, okay? Understand how you develop the steady state solution by setting the time derivative equal to zero, and then imposing the boundary conditions, and then getting the solution. Don't go and try to memorize this boundary, this condition here. Okay, so now you've obtained the steady state, and this is basically the trick. The trick is that you're going to express the solution of this full problem as a, as a sum of an unknown function plus the steady state. Basically, you subtract out the steady state. Okay? So now, what you're going to do is you're going to set u of x and t equal to the steady state solution you found before plus an unknown function x and t, like that, okay? Okay, and um, someone's asked a very good question about what do you expect the temperature to do? Does it oscillate? Does it diverge? Um, let, let's get to the end of this and I'll make sure, I'll try to remember to answer that question um, before we disband. Okay, so I'm going to set this function here where this is the steady state, and so u of x here is the steady state that you, we, we found before. And now let's substitute this into these sets of equations and then see what happens. Right? Well, what happens when I put it into the PDE? Right? Well, I'm going to differentiate this with time, which disappears. And then I have the time derivative of the u hat function. So this is just u hat of t. And on the right hand side, I have a kappa times u x x. So I have two derivatives of this. So it's a kappa times two derivatives of the big U plus two derivatives of the u hat, like so. But this is equal to zero. By design, we made sure that it was equal to zero. It was the steady state. Okay, so long story short, well, not even that long, but at the end of the day, the u hat function, this function here, satisfies the same heat equation as before. And now what happens to the boundary conditions? Well, u of 0 and t is equal to u hat at 0 
sorry, is equal to big U of zero plus U hat of zero in T. And this is now equal to T naught. But by design, you made it so that big U is equal to T naught. So those two go away, and you're left with the boundary condition of U hat is equal to zero, which is exactly what you want. So I'm going to erase this because I don't have that much space on the board. So you've concluded that having done this shift, u hat at 0 and t is now equal to 0. Because essentially you've taken account the t naught value within the big U function, the steady state. Okay? So finally, you have the second boundary condition, but the logic for the second boundary condition is the same. At the end of the day, the u hat function is also 0 on the left, so you've homogenized the boundary conditions. Now, you can apply the same algorithm as before. Okay? Well, not quite. There's one step that's missing, which is the time condition, the initial condition, and you have to remember that the initial condition actually changes. So the initial condition is that u of x and 0 is equal to f of x. So u, capital U of x plus u hat of x and 0 is equal to f of x. And so now I'm going to erase this capital U of x on the left-hand side and move it over to the right-hand side. Okay, and, and that's it. So what, so what have we done? Well, we've said if you can solve for this steady state, which is in this case nothing more than a linear function, then you can go and solve the regular PDE, except this time for a u hat. Let's erase this because it's zero. This is now kappa times u hat x x. The same PDE, the same heat equation for the u hat, Dirichlet zero, uh, sorry, Dirichlet homogeneous boundary condition, so both equal to zero, and the initial condition is just tweaked very slightly, but it doesn't really matter because if I gave you the f of x, you already know what the u of x is, you solve for it. So this just becomes a slightly different right-hand side of the function, and you use exactly the same algorithm that you had before, okay? Let's now, uh, we're, we'll, we'll do an example from the notes. So this is example 15.4. And, and at the time, my dog is getting very impatient. She's been walking around. You're getting so antsy. She's just walking around, walking around, walking around. Okay, so example 15.4. Are you going to teach or am I going to have to do it? She wants to go outside and walk around, so we have to teach for another 10 minutes and then we're going to run outside. Okay. So um, this is example 15.4. I want to solve a version of this problem here. I'll erase this thing on the right-hand side. And the version makes it a little bit simpler for you. Um, it's set the kappa equal to 1. I'm just looking it up here. It sets the kappa equal to 1. And then it sets one boundary condition equal to 2, the other one equal to 1 and it sets the length of the interval equal to pi. So if you don't mind, I'm going to just change it here on the right. We're going to set the kappa equal to 1. The boundary domain has been set to pi on the right-hand side. And this t naught function, this t naught constant, rather, is going to be equal to 2. And on the right here is equal to 1. And the initial condition will be set to be equal to 0. Okay, so again, we're going to try to plot what we think the function will look like on the right here. Okay, so it's now a bar from 0 to pi, okay? And the left-hand side condition is set to be 2. The right-hand side condition is set to be 1, like this. And initially, at time t is equal to 0, 
the bar is set to zero degrees throughout like this, okay? So once you kick off time, as soon as time starts off from zero, it, the, the two ends of the boundaries will then be set one to be two, the other one to be set to one. So it's going to look like this initially, right? Because the center of the bar has not felt yet the, the heat applied at the ends, two and one. Eventually, it's going to reach a steady state, and the steady state, as we said, is just a line that goes from two to one. So this here is the big U of X. Okay? So in order for us to solve the problem, the algorithm is almost the same algorithm as, as we just wrote out um, for the, the homogeneous version. What you have to do firstly is you have to solve for the steady state. Okay, so let's do that now. So step zero is you have to convert this problem into one where the boundary conditions are zero at either end. So let's solve for the steady state. I'm going to write the steady state as s times ss here. And in the steady state, u of xt is just a capital U of x like this. And I want to remind you not to memorize the steady state solution and to kind of figure out how you do it, right? So you're going to substitute this in the PDE. This is not a function of time on the right-hand side, so this ut will disappear on the left-hand side. And you're left with uxx equal to zero. So you have to solve the system big U xx equal to zero, big U at zero is equal to two, and big U at uh, pi is equal to one. Okay? And so you integrate this twice, it just becomes a line, ax plus b, and then solve for your constant a and your constant b. So if I put these two together, I will have big U equal to one minus x over pi. Okay, so just make sure if I set x equal to zero, it should be two, two minus x over pi. Okay, if I set x equal to zero, I have two. If I set x equal to pi, I have one, so we're good. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna shift the solution. If you don't mind, I'm gonna erase this section here. So I have big U equal to two minus x over pi. Okay. And um, now, step one, I do my separation of variables procedure. So I'm going to let little u of x and t now be, remember, you're going to subtract out the big u of x. And now you have a u hat like this. OK? So you've written the solution, the desired solution, as a sum of the thing that you just found plus an unknown u hat. And then now you need to figure out what the equation for u hat is. But we sort of know already what that's going to happen. You get the same equation as the heat equation, just with hats everywhere. So the system that you have to solve is essentially u hat t equal to u hat at x. You have the boundary condition that u hat at 0 will be 0 by design, because we've, we've taken care of the big u of x here. And this will be the same as the boundary condition on the right. And then you have an initial condition to satisfy. So the initial condition, all right, this should read x and 0. The initial condition will be basically 0, and then you have to subtract out the solution that you found before. Okay. If you don't, re if you're not confident in remembering that you have to subtract this out, just set here instead of u of x and zero, I have a u hat of x and zero plus a big u of x, and then you'll move that big u of x over to the right hand side, and you get this. Okay. So um, that's basically it. So now you know how to, you already know how to solve this type of problem, right? You've already solved this for some. Let's call it f tilde f bar of x or f tilde of x. You've already solved it moments ago for that for that problem with f tilde of x. It was exactly the same problem, the heat equation with zero Dirichlet conditions on the ends, and you form a sine series. Okay? 
So let's, um, I'm going to skip a few steps and get to there. Okay, so I, I suppose you're sort of step two to four, two to three, I can't, you know, because some of it is for the separation variables procedure. But um, at the end of the day, you would have concluded that u hat of x and t is a sign series. This is now a bn times sine of n times x. Times an exponential e to the minus n squared cap times t. In this case, cap is e to the one. Right? And this runs from n is equal to one to infinity. Okay. And just remember, I need five minutes ringing the bell. I mean, she needs to go outside. Um, just remember that this only works for the interval from 0 to pi. If this was for an interval from 0 to L, then this changes very slightly, right? So this becomes an n pi x over L. It's a different kind of combination. So just remember that the, the, the problem, the example we're doing, is for the domain to pi. If this was a, a slightly different domain, you have to change this sinusoidal function. Okay, and then you have to apply the initial condition. Okay. So u hat then of x and 0, which is equal to the sine series without the exponential, is then equal to the negative of the u of x function. OK? So at this point, you can just cite the coefficients at the end. It is the same logic as you did before. It becomes an odd periodic extension of this right-hand side function. So I'm going to skip to the answer, but then on tomorrow's, we'll go more slowly and, and, and do it properly. So the bn's here will just be 2 over l, 2 over pi, the integral from 0 to pi of that minus u of x function times sine of nx. OK, and then in tomorrow's Friday morning class, we'll put the u of x function in that we found, we'll integrate everything, and I'll plot the solution for you, and then you'll see, oh, it, it is very sensible what that solution is. Okay. Um, and before we disband, I promised I was going to answer someone's question. Someone had asked, uh, I think the question was, can you expect the solution, would it, you know, what kind of behaviors? I, can, I don't remember the exact question. But I think the, the gist of the question was, you know, we, we, we draw these kind of pictures. How do you know that it really does look like this, right? How do you know that it doesn't, for example, you know, would it do something like that, right? Or how do you know it doesn't halfway through blow up to a singularity, right? You partly know, um, you partly know from physical intuition, right? It's probably the case that the solution is not going to oscillate in this way, even though when you plot the Fourier series, you do get those oscillations. That's just an artifact of your Fourier series, right? And you also know that if I were to heat a, you know, if I heat a bar or I heat something in my oven and I set one side to be some temperature and set another side to be another temperature, it's probably not going to be the case that the solution is going to be unbounded. It's not going to go off to infinity, the temperature, okay? So heat in general, the um, the defining characteristic of heat is essentially diffusion. It spreads out. If I have a bar and I heat the center up to something very hot, and I let it go in time, what happens is that that heat spreads, and then it, it distributes in the body. Okay? So the answer is basically no. You know, I've not proven that the solution is boring like this, but in general, heat is very boring. It doesn't have these oscillations in there. It doesn't have that unbounded growth. In this course, we don't prove those kinds of statements, but you could do if you wanted to. You can actually sit down and try to write out, write out some rigorous theorems about do you expect the heat to be bounded or unbounded? And you often do that through energy. So you write down an equation for the energy and then kind of establish bounds for that energy. Okay?